So uh, there's this thing that I'm really interested in that uh, if you're watching this, probably you're kind of interested in too. And it's this idea of data ops and it feels emergent, but I think probably a lot of people have been doing a great job of it for a long time. And it was something I really wanted to talk to Emily and Stephen about. And this is a shorter clip sort of chunked out, cut out of a, a longer interview with the two of them in which I sort of uh, acknowledged my own ignorance and, and sort of looked for some clarity on the term and, and the benefits of it and sort of how we can think about it and how we can maybe do it better. I am, here it is. So talk to me about, about data ops. Um, this is a term and I think it has a meaning, um, but I'm not sure like what it is. Um, it feels important. Um, do y'all feel like you do data ops? Not in my current role. I think yeah. I feel I am much more passionate today about uh, the importance of data ops as someone sitting outside of the data team because sure. now I need that number. I pull up that chart and it's broken or it's not working or the numbers are just wrong. Uh, now my job isn't to fix those things anymore. I need that to do the rest of my job. Um, I think of data ops as the processes by which a data team improves cycle time uh, and improves data reliab reliability and data quality mm -hmm. um, and data integrity is part of that. And I think this manifests in a couple different ways, but the big three that I point to is um, working in with a single source of truth and, and version controlled data practices. Um, so mostly working out of a repo, uh, working with a change management system using merge requests or pull requests and having testing on your data, because then the data team can catch problems before they make it out to the end user. So on my side, Zapier actually spun out a specific data ops organization hmm. and our org structure is a little bit different than you would sort of typically expect a data organization to have, I think. But one of the benefits is understanding lanes of ownership and that can be super helpful as long as the relationship across those silos is really good. Mm -hmm. And at least for now, that is still the case because the data team sort of split in two one on the data engineering side. So the data engineering side has data ops, data warehouse engineers, data engineers, and then the decision science and analytics side, which has what we call decision scientists and other people might call data analysts or analytics engineers or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that split has come a little bit of clarity on what parts of the pipeline do different people own, and when someone else notices a problem, you have the idea of who to go to, who's responsible for that. And that's been helpful for sure. But we are definitely not yet a world-class organization in terms of data reliability or any of that material mm -hmm. at the moment. It still definitely re requires potentially someone like me noticing that, hey, this number's out of date or you're missing three days in the middle of December or something like that, where we actually have probably a suite of 100 or 200 tests and there's still a bunch of stuff that ends up slipping. Yeah. And so I think data ops is not new. Like this, this function has been around as long as SQL you know, databases. This is not like a new function. It would be naive of us to think just because we're doing it in a slightly different way in the cloud, that sort of thing, that we are fundamentally treading new ground. But I do think that as data has become more accessible and self-serve tooling has become better, that the importance of data ops only increases because there are more people looking at it. It's, mistakes are more visible inside the org and that it, it's really meaningful for people to make sure that when they make an assumption based on a set of data that they looked at, that that data is accurately portrayed. What, um, what is your sense of what it would mean to be a world-class organization in, in terms of data ops? 
That is a great question. And I am not 100% sure that very many people nail it. I've seen a bunch of anecdotes around analytics Slack, analytics Twitter, where even the organizations that you think of as sort of being amazing in this space, in particular, I'm thinking of Facebook, where they have a ton of data and you would expect that they, if anyone is good at this, they're good at this. Right. But there are jokes that flow around the Twitter sphere of, you know, an Excel file named data V7 final X3. <laughs> and that's not great practice either. Right, so they're right. just making it work as much as the rest of us. Um, if somebody out there has really nailed this and feels super confident that they are doing it right, I would love to hear from them. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to me that you thought of Facebook because I thought of Airbnb. Oh, it's a good one. Why Airbnb? I don't know. I guess that's that's just the one that popped into my head. I've been following their engineering blog for a long time. Yeah, great blog. Yeah, I don't. I guess I don't think of Airbnb as an organization doing data ops. I think of them as definitely like data driven and, and seems like they've got their data science stuff really sort of buttoned up. And I guess maybe a little bit data ops when it's working properly is sort of invisible behind, behind all that. Am I wrong to remember that Airflow actually came out of Airbnb and their data engineering org? That sounds familiar to me. I think Superset came out of, out of their work as well, right? Possible. So they're definitely at the forefront of some of this material. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh, Airflow came out of Airbnb engineering in June, 2015. Wow. That's where that comes from in my head. Good for them, yeah. we use it. <laughs> yeah, we do so too. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Airbnb is the first that pops into my head, Netflix is the second. Netflix, sure. Netflix is a good one right, with all the recommendation and just the, I mean, they, I, I wonder, I wonder how much of when we think about sort of, cause I, I still think, I mean, I recognize data ops is something that has existed in organizations for a long time, but really sort of talking about it in the explicit way that we're talking about it now, I think is still a little bit on the new side. And I wonder how much of really successful data ops right now is just being like close to people doing really excellent DevOps, right? Because you think about Airbnb and Netflix, those are both companies that have to handle just an enormous amount of development and must have excellent practices behind it. And I wonder how much of, how much of this can be sort of chalked up to adjacency, right? Just sort of good fortune. Yeah, I also might turn the table on you all uh, because the question that I have that's related to this is how does it play with B2C versus B2B? And a lot of the times when you're thinking about huge data engineering recommendation in particular practices, you're thinking of Amazon with just an amazing amount of B2C data, right. where in any B2B space, you are considerably more limited. And so your data infrastructure doesn't have to hold up to the quite the scale that a huge B2C organization does. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible that the ones that we think of, like you're mentioning, that have these amazing DevOps organizations because of their natural B2C distribution engine, um, that B2B companies like Emily and I work at may not have had to scale to that point, even mm -hmm. though we're relatively large from a B2B tech startup sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. It does feel like it, you know, they're probably related. I mean, who, who's to say? Um, well, although kind of interestingly, I, I mean, it is worth exploring too that sort of the primary customer of excellent data ops is internal, right? Like it's y'all, it's C-suite, it's product, it's marketing. Whereas sort of the, the folks who benefit ostensibly from excellent DevOps are like the eventual customer, right? And I think in a lot of organizations, it's really hard to get motivated and get resourced to serve purely internal customers. Um, has that been y'all's experience or no? I can think very specifically of some internal tooling that if it breaks once a month or once every other week, 
if it's an internal customer, maybe that's fine. And that person has to wait an hour or two for something to reload or some sort of bug to be fixed. Whereas if that were delivered to an external customer, that would never fly. So there's definitely a trade-off in terms of prototype versus productionized equipment and reliability concerns that as you start to serve external customers with recommendation maybe being the primary case where the data org most obviously can serve customers, you have to build in way better reliability and fallbacks when you start to drift in that direction than when you're serving internally. When it's 100% internal tooling, I think you're totally spot on that it's just hard to justify the V2, V3, V4 work to make things super stable that it would take when the benefit of it is internal only. Yeah. It's an 80-20 thing, right? Totally. Classic. <laughs> yeah. So let me let me let's talk a little bit more about 